What I have here is a Micron Millennia M55 HI Plus P166-MT. This is a Socket 7 system with a Pentium 166 in it right now. And this is one of the computers that I was given by Casey and was the one that I was most interested in because, well, I mean, look at it. It's just gorgeous. Now, the last time we looked at this computer, I attempted to power it up and it did post at first. It then proceeded to degrade before our eyes and uh, I really didn't know what was wrong with it other than it has a weird cheap Insignia power supply in it. Well, after some research, it turns out that power supply is from 2014, so not in the middle of the capacitor plague era like I initially thought. But I'm still hoping the power supply is the issue because I now have a use case for this computer that I want to try and get it set up for today. A while ago now, I built a test bench computer to more easily test different kinds of things like software and hardware, and that's been a really great computer. But I've been hesitant to show it on video because while people know what it is, it does look a little weird and is distracting when new people come watch the channel, so it's not my favorite thing to use. So what I'm hoping to achieve with this is a test computer that I can use in videos after I test stuff with the test bench that won't be as distracting. And additionally, I really need something that is a complete system like this for hardware like this that needs to be included into a case so we can actually use it and check it out, because, uh, oh man, there is plenty of cool stuff that I want to get to that really isn't going to do well in the test bench. So today, we're going to try and swap the power supply in this to see if that solves its problems, as well as take a closer look at what it has in it. And then for the first thing I'm going to test with it, I'm going to try out a Voodoo 1 with it. That I've had to do some board repair on. All right, let's get this open here. And one of the reasons I like the idea of using this as a test system is that is a toolless side panel. So that will make it easy to work on. But some other things here. For one, um, this system has been modified. Uh, so there was some kind of piece of metal that connected the top and bottom of the power supply cover, cut so that it could fit a different power supply from the original one. And that's one of the reasons why that uh, trying to maintain this system as original probably isn't worth it, although we're not gonna make too many modifications, but uh, that makes something like this a better choice to use than say the gateway I used for the Windows 95 system. That thing is basically completely stock, so I definitely wanna leave that alone. So we're gonna end up taking out that power supply because I'm hoping that it is bad, but as you can see, just by the cables alone that have um, SATA, it's way newer than uh, the rest of the system. So I don't know if that's gonna be the problem. I am really hoping that it is though. Now I do want to explore much more of this system than we did last time, but getting that power supply out of here will help make that easier. So let's just get this out of the way now. That way uh, we don't have to worry about it. All right. So in the system right now, there is a 3Com PCI Ethernet card, as well as a diamond branded S3 Verge Onboard uh, 3D card. And this might be a problem for the uh, Voodoo, but we'll take a look at that when we get there. As well as this, which we did look at last time, but it's just so glorious. I'm gonna pop it out and uh, we'll take another look at it. This is the crown jewel of this system for sure the blue anodized passive heat sink for the Pentium 166 in there. Oh, I just love this thing. It is so, so pretty. Looking at the bottom of the chip, we can see that it is an SY037, which is a Pentium 166 with a 66 megahertz bus speed. This is a non MMX chip, which is good because there's something this motherboard is missing. As I'm putting the CPU back in here, take note of this, which is a VRM socket. It allows you to add the split rail, dual voltage, however you want to think about it, support needed to run MMX CPUs in this system. Now, last time we were looking at this system, I remarked that it was weird the serial port was above the PS2 ports. And there's another interesting thing about that, but before we can even get to that, uh, I noticed something else interesting about this fan that is actually toolessly removable. Uh, if you can poke these, 
that just uh, slides up and uh, pops out like that. This case is really pretty darn well designed. And this is what I saw that was hilarious. Most of the connectors on this ATX panel are just actually panel mounted to it like you would with an AT case. It doesn't have headers for most of the things, uh, except for the audio and the PS2 ports, from what I can see. Uh, maybe the game port as well, since that's part of the sound card, which I don't think it occurred to me that it had a sound card on board before. Huh, let's try and figure out what that actually is. Well, I don't know what I was thinking it would be, but I guess I wasn't thinking of Vibra 16. I mean, I guess that's better than like a Crystal or an ESS type thing on here, but uh, yeah, it's just an okay sound card. At the least, it should be compatible with a bunch of stuff, so I can probably get away without putting one in most of the time if I want. Now, lastly in this system, we have the drives along the front, and one of these is not like the others. Uh, we have a standard three and a half inch drive that I've left that disc in. You should probably look at what's actually on there at some point here. Uh, then up top, we have an optical drive that looks pretty standard for the era. A five and a quarter inch drive, which I still haven't looked up what the capacity it actually is. I'm still going with uh, 1.2 meg since the LED is green. And then we have this, the iOmega Ditto Drive. However, this is a Ditto 3200, so this is actually kind of difficult to use. Now, initially in this video, I was actually kind of hoping to try and do a transfer to something like this, but this is a Ditto 800, and uh, these aren't compatible. The Ditto 800 uses tapes like this that are Quick 80 compatible, and while this will physically fit in the drive, it apparently can't read it according to Wikipedia. So no matter what, uh, I don't own any tapes that'll actually work in this thing. So there's not a lot of reason to leave it in there. <laughs> and actually, whoever was last using this machine had disconnected it because it takes up a spot on the floppy interface and it already had two drives. I could solve that issue by putting a floppy switchboard in here, but still, I don't have tapes and I don't really need that. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and just not use that. I would remove it, but I don't have another blinking panel that'll match like this one to go there. So that's everything that's in the computer. But there's one thing that isn't. A hard drive. This has nothing to boot from. Now, it would make sense for me to put something like this in here, an SD to IDE adapter, since I want to use this as a test system. But this is where the hard drive mounts, on this bracket and those tabs go into the screw holes on the hard drive on the side there, and then it f goes and just snaps in place, and you put one screw in there right there to hold the hard drive, which is kind of awesome. Uh, you can put another one there if you want. Then you just slide the hard drive into the uh, machine here, and it's held in. The front plate can be removed with three snaps, and <clears throat> then there are two screws uh, right here that will hold the hard drive uh, bracket in place. Now, this whole setup is kind of uniquely weird and cool, and it makes me want to actually use a real hard drive <laughs> rather than the uh, SD card thing. And then the other problem is that, uh, yeah, yeah how, would I, how would I mount that? Um, this is not really designed to be mountable in any normal way anyway, so it's always usually a pain, but even if I 3D printed something for this, it would have to be kind of designed in a particular way to work here. So I think I am just gonna go with a, a regular hard drive here this time. It's kind of been a while since I've used a real hard drive in a system like this anyway. So uh, I kind of want to do that just cause eh, it's been a while. So I will get uh, some screws and put that in there. And that's the hard drive mounted. That is such a weird solution for that. I'm not really sure what it gains you. It means you must take off the faceplate to remove the hard drive, which is kind of a pain, but oh well. All right, I've already got it jumpered for master, so I'm just gonna go ahead and plug in the IDE cable, and that will do it. All right, uh, now I'm gonna go ahead and put a different power supply back in here. Here's the original one. <laughs> I was just laughing at myself for a moment because uh, the power supply I picked out here um, looks a lot fancier and newer, but it's actually two years older than this one, I just realized. Uh, it's just a much higher end model. 
But uh, I know this one is still good and working because I was running my main editing computer off of it this year. Uh, so it's going to be fine, <laughs> but it's just kind of funny that uh, I doubt the other one due to how old it is, but this one's even older. This one's also ridiculous with the cable, so this is going to be fun. All right, we're going to go ahead and leave it umbilicaled uh, for now just to do a test. Uh, startup. That way I can know if this system's good. It's worth trying to cram all of this into there. All right, I've got some peripherals here for us to test this thing out. Let me turn on the power supply and now the system. Okay, will it actually post correctly with a functional power supply? Let's find out. That's looking a lot better than uh, we ended it with last time. I have no idea what's on that hard drive, uh, so we're going to not spend too much time on that if it will boot. Okay, give up, give up on the disk there. You're not going to boot that. This is what it did last time. Uh-oh. Okay, there's something not power supply wrong with this system. That sucks. All right, uh, first test, I'm trying some completely different RAM. Okay, so it pretends, yeah, okay, like it's gonna boot. I wonder if it needs a functioning battery. Well, so far this seems more responsive. Maybe? There's one other thing to try. Let it attempt booting the floppy. Maybe there's some like virus on this floppy where it just makes the system lock up. That'd be kind of hilarious if it's that. Oh, well, okay, that's significantly different. All right, I'm really starting to think it was bad RAM, huh? So, what of that is bad then? <laughs> Because it never made it that far, and it would totally make sense if it was trying to load, I guess, the Windows 98 boot disk. Um, if it was uh, putting more data into RAM and then failing. So, yeah, something in there is probably bad. Uh, huh. That floppy is a BIOS update disk. Uh, huh. Well, let's look at the BIOS and see if there's any version information listed. A little extra scary that this thing may have had a BIOS update attempt. So we're at S04, BIOS update attempt with bad RAM installed. So I've got the retro web, formerly Ultimate Retro up uh, on one of my computers here because I was looking at this thing, trying to figure out maybe there's like a voltage configuration issue on the motherboard because that's what gave me so many errors with the Tiny Pentium for years. So I was wondering if maybe it could have been that, but uh, no, clearly, RAM, uh, since you can all that immediately solved the problem. So uh, I didn't pay attention to how much we have now, but uh, yeah, it seems to be working much better. Let's actually pay attention this time. All right, so 32 megs of RAM, eh, it's, it's all right. We might roll with that. It had 64 in it before, so that's the same uh, size stick as all that stuff. So I could bring it back up to 64 if I figure out which pair is bad, because we have uh, two sets of two sticks here one of those is likely bad, and then we can put the other set back in. Okay, I just looked, S versus NS is sound versus no sound. We have sound, so apparently the BIOS update is uh, good, we're already at that, and version four is the latest one, so um, we don't need to do anything with this, if it's good, which I don't know. <laughs> I'm not even thrilled about using what's on this disc uh, if this had bad memory, so we're not gonna use that. But I will go ahead and shut it down now, and put uh, each one of those pairs in there. Actually, we're just gonna put one of each stick in there. You know what, I might as well leave this in. Uh, and I'll try and deduce which one of those sticks is bad uh, to see which configuration makes it hang on post. So it's looking like one of these sticks here is probably bad, which kind of sucks. That's OEM RAM. Yeah, so we got all the way to Windows 98 without these two sticks. One of these probably has a problem, uh, but I'm just going to pull them for right now. I'm going to add these two in their place, though, which will bring us up to 64 megs total, uh, which is what this had. 
and 64 megs. We are all good to go. Well, now that it can post, I can go ahead and put it back together with the power supply worked in there. And I'm gonna go ahead and swap out the uh, CR2032 for the BIOS configuration. And it'll stop yelling at me every time I try and boot it. Just for the record, this power supply would not have needed that cut. And uh, uh, that's as good as you're getting for cable management. This is more proof of concept and there's no hope here anyway. It's real heavy with that power supply in there now, but that should be a working system. So I will have to open this up again to get the Voodoo in there when we're ready for that. But for right now, I'm just gonna put Windows 98 on here. I could put 95, which would be a little more period accurate, but 95 and 98 are basically the same and 98 is just a lot easier to use. Okay, we are ready to give this thing a shot, but um, I just had a realization right as I was about to start recording. The RAM was bad, not the power supply. So this thing's probably still fine. Uh, I guess I'll put it back in there uh, when we switch to the uh, Voodoo One, I suppose. But from here, let's go ahead and install Windows 98. Yeah, no hard drives. All right, looks like I'm gonna swap power supplies and check that out, because um, that power supply has so many giant cables in there, it kind of really makes it difficult, and I can see that being the problem. So I'll join up back with you once the hard drive's detected. That hard drive I picked, which was only 40 gigs, and I thought gonna be pretty safe, may not work in this. So I put that SD card adapter uh, in there, as you can see that. Uh, that's a 32 gigabyte SD card that I'm suspecting is actually formatted to 32 gigs. And it only shows up as eight here. Um, I was wrong earlier, this thing is from 1996. It's possible that it really can't handle anything more than eight. Um, seems a little weird though, but maybe, I don't know. I don't really care that much. So I'm gonna go try and find a much smaller hard drive and throw that in here and see how it goes. There we go, working with a 3.1 gig Western Digital Caviar drive that was actually made in August 1996. So I think two months before the computer itself. So that is a perfect match. Okay, with all that fixed now, the hard drive is showing up. F disk is allowing me to create a partition. So now I should finally be able to install uh, Windows 98 here in a moment. Oh. <laughs> well, that's unexpected. 27 minutes of installation and, uh, huh. Okay, it's a couple days later now, and when I last left you, I was trying to install Windows 98 on this thing. But that floppy disk that was in this computer turned out to be a bigger problem than I anticipated. Let me get this booting right now uh, so you can see what's going on here. So the problem I was having was during the install of Windows 98, I would boot it from the floppy because it doesn't support CD boot, and then begin the installation process from the CD to the hard drive, where everything would work perfectly fine until it got to the installation point where it needed to reboot the computer. At that point, you are supposed to remove the Windows 98 boot floppy and boot from the hard drive so it can complete the installation. However, this computer would absolutely refuse to boot from the hard drive. Now this is the Western Digital Caviar drive that I had put in there originally, and you can see it's clearly working. I spent so much time troubleshooting issues with this. I tried changing all of the settings in the BIOS. I tried swapping over to a PCI IDE controller. I changed through multiple drives, nothing would work. I got to the point where I was out of ideas and I posted on my Pleroma instance uh, to see if anyone had any ideas what the problem could be. 
And while I hadn't thought to F disk MBR, I've never had to do that on a Windows 98 era computer, but even that, which was the most common recommendation, didn't solve it. So feeling like it was the end for this computer because the onboard IDE controller seemed dead, I thought I would take a look at it on stream, which was not something I really wanted to do, but I had just got in the Cali box Navy switches that I'd ordered after I was sent one in a mail video and turned out to really like them. And I figured I could work on this computer in the background while I was swapping switches over on my keyboard. Well, we went through a lot of the same troubleshooting steps as I already did just to fully document and sanity check that I didn't miss anything. And in the end, we didn't find anything wrong with it until several of my viewers pieced together something unusual about this motherboard. It was available in different revisions and those revisions are not cross compatible with the BIOS. So it turned out an incompatible BIOS had been flashed to this system that in all other ways seemed to have worked, except for booting the hard drive. So we got the correct BIOS from a page archived thanks to archive.org and we're able to flash it onto the system. And now that's where we are. This is a fresh install of Windows 98. I have installed nothing else. And this computer has actually been an experience that I have never had before with a fresh install of Windows 98. Now, starting off here, if you know what that means, that's just one of several things that I was not expecting. But as I complete the login, pay attention here. That is sound, full color, and the login screen at the beginning means that the 3Com network card is working. Those are usually the things after you set up Windows 98 that you have to spend time tracking down drivers to get them to work. But all, all of the hardware in this machine just worked right out of the box. No drivers necessary. Now the ones that were included on the Windows 98 disk are probably not the most up-to-date ones, but Still, I have never had a computer just work out of the box like this. That is incredible and makes me really happy that I'm going to be using this system as a sort of secondary test bench because it's going to be really easy to manage the hardware in it with Windows. Now, my real goal for this video was just to get this computer to this state. It's actually fully functional now ignoring the tape drive that I can't use anyway. So here I can call this project pretty much done, but I do still want to try out the Voodoo One in it today. So we're gonna take a look at that. I'm not gonna do like a full review video of the Voodoo One. I just wanna make sure that this thing actually works because I've had to do a repair on it and I think I only barely tested it. Now a quick primer, if you're not familiar with what the Voodoo One is, it is a 3D only chipset which means that it's going to still utilize the S3 Verge that's in the computer now. And it does this using the VGA pass-through system on here, which means I need a coupling cable to go from the Verge card to this one. Unfortunately, I don't have a good short one here right now for this. The only one I have is connected to the tiny Pentium at home. But you can use any VGA extension cable to do this job as well. So I've got this slightly shorter one here I'm gonna use instead. Since it will still utilize this S3 card, it means I need both in the system at the same time. So we're gonna install the Voodoo card just under the S3 card. Then it's the fun of connecting the output of the S3 card to the input on the Voodoo One, and then we can connect the monitor to the output of the Voodoo One. When the 3D portion is not active on the Voodoo One, that GenDAC chip will actually pass through the S3's output directly. Then when it switches to 3D mode, it will disable this and output only from the Voodoo on here. It's somewhat of a misconception that the GenDAC chip allows the Voodoo to overlay 3D graphics or underlay. It is an either or situation. 
Now before I push the power button on here, let me really quickly cover why I really need to test this card. This was sent to me by Tomatolicious so long ago I don't even remember when, but it came from a scrap card lot, and I'm pretty sure it was in there because it was broken. Because it was broken. One of the outputs for the VGA connector had a trace just blown. I don't know how this happened, but I was able to repair it by bodging a wire from where the trace came from to where it was going, just bypassing the part that was broken. Now, if I remember correctly, I did test that it actually output video, but I don't remember that I fully tested that the card actually worked. So that's what I really want to do today. So let's just see what happens, because I don't remember much about this card uh, so far. The text being white here means that we're getting all three color channels, so that is good. Now, I actually cannot remember if I'm going to need drivers for the Voodoo One or not. Not because Windows 98 has them included, but because it might be one of those cards where the drivers are just kind of included with the game. This early 3D era was kind of crazy, uh, so I'm not 100% sure. It may even be somewhat game dependent on the Voodoo One. I really don't have a lot of experience here. All I know is that early Voodoo stuff is kind of a huge pain in the butt. All right, installing software for your new hardware. That's a good sign? Really? It just has Voodoo drivers, huh? Okay then. Yeah, it's just there, I guess. Yes, manufacturer, 3D Interactive, driver, Microsoft from, I mean, okay, sure. Uh, let's just run with that. Let's just see what happens. I'm curious. Now, when it comes to making an early 3DFX card work, there is one game above all others that I always turn to to try it out. And that is Pod, Planet of Death. This game is kind of a pain in the butt to get working. <laughs> and this is Pod Gold, which if I remember correctly, is specifically designed to out of the box work with a 3DFX Voodoo 1. So I'm actually very curious here to see what the installation process for this is gonna be like on this system because I always have to do a bunch of workarounds and tricks and stupid nonsense to get this thing to work correctly with a Voodoo 2. But if it just works with a Voodoo 1, that would be kind of amazing. All right, let's go ahead and get the media out. This is a disc that contains instructions and patches for getting and working with a Voodoo 2, but this is the disc itself. And every single release of Pod I have has just absolutely horrible <laughs> artwork on the CD. This is just a screenshot with HUD cropped onto the sides with an MMX logo and the Ubisoft logo just slapped on there. It's delightfully horrible. <laughs> All right, it's time to swap out the Windows 98 disc for Pod. Let's see how this goes. All right. It should, <laughs> yeah, so it's not working. Um, software requires, yeah. So it should be possible to install, um, where is it down here? Yeah, large installation with 3DFX card, okay? Required components are missing. 3DFX card. Hmm. Press X to doubt. So the way the installer checks for this is very dumb, actually. I think I have a description of how it does this on this floppy. So let's take a look at this. Yeah, this is what I thought. The pod installer looks for glide.dll and sst1init.dll in the Windows systems folder. <laughs> It doesn't actually check that there are drivers installed or anything. It just looks for these files being there. So you can spoof it by having the drivers just kind of be there or even make empty files there. Uh, but that's how it checks. Without those files, it will not allow you to install the 3DFX version. It just refuses. So we can see it knows it's not an MMX processor, which is correct. It knows it has enough memory, but it's also misidentifying the S3 card which this is, but let's just ignore that for now. And it's misidentifying the 3DFX card. So we need to get the Voodoo drivers that I guess it will like. Um, I'm curious if this says which drivers it's using. There's a bunch of Voodoo drivers in here. That's kind of cool. But I guess these aren't stored in 
just the right place for this thing. Uh, we could try, you know what, let's follow the directions on the floppy. Let's try and put uh, some blank files in the system folder and see if we can make this work without actually installing anything else. So those are our spoof files. So now we will go back to the CD and try to install it. There we go with 3DFX card install. For the record, it might also be possible to just ignore that entirely because on the disc, there are just different executables for pod. One that is pod 3DFX, one that's pod S3, one that's pod ATI, and then pod uh, software and pod MMX, if I remember correctly. So you can probably just do the regular install and then just move the executable over for the version that you want. I'm not 100% sure that this is going to work. Uh, just that it'll find the drivers that Windows has installed and utilize those. But I'm curious, which is why I'm doing this. And there we are. That is pod installed. Let's hope that that works. I'm also going to go back over to here, though, and grab the files we've added. So back to this. Uh, does it look like there were more files added? Thanks, pod installer. Uh, but we're going to delete these because, I mean, they're empty properties. We can see this should be zero bytes. Yeah. So uh, no matter what, having these in here will only cause problems. So we're going to remove those. And then I am actually going to heed pod's warning and restart. I'm not sure that it's necessary, but this game is such pain to get working that I would rather just cross all the T's and dot all the I's. All right, to play pod. Let's see if it runs. All right. Well, kinda had a feeling that was coming. All right, I'm gonna go look up Voodoo One drivers and maybe uh, directions on getting this working. Um, yeah, so that's the pod executable for the Voodoo card there. Like I was telling you, uh, if we just open this uh, we can find other executables in here for the other ones. Um, we have pods 3DX, WinPod, yeah. So I bet if I put WinPod in here, we can just run that. Yeah, so that'll work just fine. This is running pure software with no MMX or 3D hardware acceleration. So this will probably... Not run great, but we still get one of the best parts of the game. The menu sound. That, yeah, yes. Oh, yeah. There are, there are multiple frames happening per second. I am so impressed that this just has sound, by the way. This is just ridiculous. Uh, sound's not particularly hard to get working in pod, it's just... I didn't have to do anything for sound. This has a particular crunchy, wobbly poly charm, but this isn't what I remember Pod being. So let me go back and get those 3D FX drivers working uh, so we can experience this the way that it was meant to be played. All right, I think I've got a viable Voodoo One driver from Falconfly here, so let's give this a shot. I think we're still gonna need the Pod patch. Ah, oh, great. Because I don't see glide.dll and st something.dll. So this is still going to be a pain to install. Let's install the drivers that I just got. See if they're compatible with this card. So they're glide 2, it looks like. I will try running pod from here, but there's no way it's going to work. I'm going to have to go down. I'm going to have to go download pod patch. Okay, uh, after a bit of digging around, I burnt a CDR that has only 83 megs of data on it, but whatever. Uh, I grabbed like all of the patches for pod on the internet, except for the content patches, get new cars and tracks, because that frankly would have took longer than I wanted to. Uh, so I was able to get uh, a patch that adds Voodoo and Voodoo Rush compatibility to pod, and it's a pod 2.0 patch. I thought that's what this was, but maybe there's a difference between Pod Gold and Pod 2.0. I, I don't know. It's all such a huge pain in the butt with Pod, but it works. So we can run Pod, get the 3DFX logo there, actually, uh, 
and try this in hardware rendered mode. Okay, so I'm gonna do same thing as last time, random track, random car, okay, and go. Oh, that is so much smoother. And I don't just mean the texture filtering, the performance is wildly better. It still absolutely blows my mind that sound just worked. It's not perfect, it's got some skipping that it does every now and then, so I'm probably gonna have to find some actual Vibra 16C drivers uh, at some point. But still, this is a very good out-of-box experience with Windows 98. And yeah, the Voodoo 1 clearly works, so uh, that's really good to know. I can uh, mark this one as usable, and if I want to make a fuller featured video about it now, I know I can. Well, there we go. The Micron Millennia back up and running. I'm really glad that I was able to resuscitate this computer and now have the ability to put it into service for something actually useful. I look forward to using it more to try out different hardware like this in the future because it's a really attractive system and it's <laughs> so easy to use. I knew it was gonna be easy to work on with hardware, but I was not expecting everything inside of it to just work out of the box with Windows 98. That is going to make testing with this thing so easy in the future. I am really looking forward to that. But that is everything I wanted to try with it today. If you enjoyed this video about getting the system back up and running, you may want to subscribe because it will definitely be coming back in the future. If you want to help support the channel, you can find me on Patreon. But for now, that's it, and I will see you next time.